All righty, y'all. Good evening. Um, welcome to uh, today's listening session um, on the proposed uh, curfew ordinance for minors. Um, first, I want to extend a warm welcome. I nor normally with our listening circles, we give a lot more of advance notice, but um, with the deliberations taking place with council, we wanted to make sure that we hear from um, our District 6 residents um, on the proposed um, curfew ordinance that the City Council will be um, voting on here soon. Um, so the City Council is currently in the process of um, reviewing and considering the reauthorization um, of the current curfew ordinance for minors, which has been in effect since 1995. Um, you all know that um, the safety of our kiddos um, is something that's, you know, really important for me. Um, and even um, more so now, it's real for me being a new father of a four-week-old. <laughs> um, so lack of sleep and all, she's a bundle of joy. But needless to say, um, the safety of our kids is something that's really important to me. Um, you know, in our office, um, in the District 6 office, uh, we've especially been focused on the safety of our kiddos, um, and that's why you've seen us um, work to spearhead a $6 million investment um, in the One Second Collaborative to address and prevent youth gun violence. Um, that's why you saw us fight to ensure that no kid has to pay for community center memberships um, in our community centers. Um, and also why we worked um, recently to extend um, a late night hours for our teens to play in a safe space um, at the Chisholm Trail Community Center. Um, and so needless to say, um, when it comes to um, the safety of our kiddos, um, I don't know if there's a bigger advocate than Dr. J. And so um, thank you all for being advocates for our kiddos as well um, and sh um, showing up and sharing um, your thoughts in this very important discussion. Um, I'll walk through the agenda for the evening really quickly and then um, just kind of highlight some resources we have available for you. Um, also, for those of you who are watching online, um, thank you for participating in this discussion. Um, and we'll make sure that all the resources that are provided um, here are made available to you as well. Um, so for today's discussion, um, I really want to hear from you all. Um, I say this all the time, but this seat is not Jared Williams' seat. Um, this is all of our seat. Um, and so that's why I depend on listening sessions and emails and phone calls um, to really understand better um, you know, the decisions uh, that you want to see this office make on important dis uh, issues that affect um, our district. And so tonight, um, we're going to spend most of the time hearing from you, but we do have a short set of presentations to kind of give context for the evening. Um, the first presentation for the night is from um, um, Letitia, who is um, representing the city of Fort Worth, um, the city uh, attorney's office, and she'll be um, giving us a brief overview of um, the, the process of um, the ordinance, what it looks like, what are the components of it, um, and describing that for us. Um, we'll also have invited uh, Mr. Ty Stimson um, from the L. Clifford Davis Legal Association um, who can explain um, for our, our minors, but also our parents and adults, um, you know, what are, the, um, what are your rights under this ordinance, um, and also what to do, um, you know, navigating the process if your child or if you as a minor get cited for this violation, um, if the ordinance gets reauthorized by the city council. Um, and after those um, very brief two um, discussions, we'll open the floor up for Q&A. So I would ask, um, since we're recording, um, we want to get through these presentations without um, questions, and then we'll certainly open up the majority of the time for your questions, concerns, thoughts, um, and we'll have a discussion. Um, we also have um, a number of city staffers here who will be available during that Q&A period. Um, we have Fernando Costa, who's assistant city manager. Um, we have um, William Runnelly, who um, works with our municipal court system. Um, and then we also have Chief Aldridge um, um, with our fourth police department, executive assistant chief, sorry, Aldridge, I wanna get your title exactly right, um, who will be able to answer questions. Um, and then also if you're city staff um, and you're here, will you mind raising your hand so that folks can see um, um, at the end of the meeting, we'll also have um, um, a little bit of time for 
uh, discussion. And so if you do want to have additional discussion with either my office or with um, city staff, um, you know who they are. Um, without um, any further ado, I'll introduce just one more thing. We have resources that we provided tonight for you all. Um, they are the proposed curfew ordinance. There's a printed document at the table in the back. Um, we, as a council office, have provided a community fact sheet um, that details um, um, information um, about the effect of the curfew ordinance since 2015. Um, and it includes youth uh, population data and then curfew violations by age and time, um, by violations with additional offenses, race and gender, and geography. Um, and then lastly, we have a comment card. So if you have to skedaddle early, we understand. Um, but know that there's a comment card and we would love to have your feedback um, as well. So please be sure to fill out that comment card on your way out so that um, my office staff can take it back as we deliberate um, and make preparations for council decisions. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll invite uh, Letitia up um, who will talk briefly about the uh, proposed curfew ordinance. Thank you, Letitia. Good evening. I'm not as tall as Councilmember Williams. So I'm going to move this just a little bit. My name is Letitia Brown and I am the Deputy City Attorney in our City Attorney's Office in the City of Fort Worth. And I've been around long enough um, that most of this uh, ordinance occurred right about the time that I was in college here in Fort Worth. I am a lifelong resident, O.D. White High School. And, um, and, so, um, I, and so this occurred right about the time that I was in, at TCU. And so um, I'm, I'm really familiar with it. I spent a great deal of my uh, uh, three years of my career as a city prosecutor. And so we prosecuted these citations. And now I'm over our litigation division at the city of Fort Worth and I supervise the prosecutors who are, are involved in the court system. So I've also advised on this uh, city ordinance uh, periodically as we renewed it. And so most of you have heard that this ordinance um, has, as it currently exists, has been in effect since 1994. Interestingly enough, we actually had a city ordinance on teen curfew as far back as 1992. We allowed that to expire and then we renewed this one in 1994 and that is the version that you see. I'm gonna go over just a little bit of the rules on this. So the first thing, and I kind of do it as a question to myself, if what I would want to know about this ordinance. The first question I would want to know is who does it apply to? Well, it applies to any minor under the age of 17. It also applies to the parent of that minor, and it also uh, um, applies to our business establishments, okay? So um, what are those curfew hours? 11 p.m. on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, until 6 o'clock the following morning. And 12.01 until 6 a.m. on any Saturday or Sunday. So what does that mean? I go out with my friends on Friday. And um, when do I have to be home if I'm 15? Well, you have to be home by 12.01 on Saturday. Okay, and that always causes some confusion. It's just 12 o'clock, it's midnight. You have to be home by midnight, okay? So that's how it goes. So a minor, a parent, or business establishment could be in violation of our city ordinance if they remain in any public place on the premises of any establishment in the city, or if you're an establishment, if you allow a minor to remain upon the premises, and if you're a parent guardian, if you permit or by insufficient control allow the minor to remain in a public place or any premises of an establishment within the city during curfew hours. So what does that mean? Well, I'm now a parent of three young adults. I have a 24-year-old, a 21-year-old, and a 19-year-old. They all were raised under the Fort Worth teen curfew. My two kids, older ones, obeyed. My baby, not so much. My baby, when he was 15, decided to sneak out of a friend's house at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. 
The parents of the friend didn't know it. My husband and I were sleeping away at home. We didn't know it. So who's in violation? Oh, by the way, let me just say, at 2.30 in the morning, they ended up at Walmart because Walmart was 24 hours at the time. Okay, so who's in violation? Well, the kid is in violation, right? He's 15 years old. He's out at 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday. He's in Sunday, right? Sunday. He's in violation. My um, parents of the friend who he was staying with, do you think he's in violation? Actually, no, he wasn't because he had no idea the kids had snuck out. Okay, all the windows were closed, the doors were locked. He wouldn't be because he was not knowingly allowing them to violate the curfew. As the parent, what do you think about me? Probably not, because I had no clue my kid had snuck out of his friend's house, right? Now, I'm going to flip it a little bit. What if I had, they had called me and said, your kid just left our house, and I said, okay, and turned around and went back to bed? Maybe, because I allowed him to be out at that point, okay? So that's how it kind of plays out. Now, what if my kid goes to a movie at 10 o'clock and the movie is a three-hour movie and the movie lets out at 1 o'clock? Could the establishment be in trouble? Maybe, okay? So those are the ways that the, the rule, the teen curfew rules could play out. The question then comes up, well, are there any defenses, any exceptions to the rule? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to read you, if you don't mind, a list of our defenses, which also are exceptions. And I'll explain to you why there are more or less exceptions. If the minor is with a parent or a guardian, they are not in violation. If they're on an errand at the direction of the parent or guardian without any detour or stop, if they're in a motor vehicle involved in interstate travel, if they're engaged in employment activity or going home from employment activity without any detours or stops, if they're involved in an emergency, so they, are, they have a flat tire and that causes them on a weeknight to be out past 11 o'clock. If they're on the sidewalk of their resident or the next door neighbor's house, as long as the neighbor is not complaining. Now, why that's very interesting is if you're in your yard, you're not in violation. If you're in the sidewalk of your yard as a, as a minor, your home, you're not in violation. You're allowed to abut the neighbor's house as long as they're not complaining that you're right there, okay? And more important for you who have kids in school, if they are attending an official school, religious, a recreational activity supervised by adults and sponsored by the city, a civil organization, or some school, or some similar entity that takes responsibility for the minor, or if they're returning home from that activity. Also, if they're engaged in a First Amendment activity, or believe it or not, if they are married. So someone who's under the age of 17 who's married is exempt from this defense. And I know that Ty is going to talk about some of the things that can, uh, you can do, uh, your rights as parents uh, when that happens, but I did want to kind of give you a little bit of enforcement penalties and what happens at court. If you are detained by PD for a violation of the curfew ordinance, the officer is going to ask you more than likely your age and the reason for being in the public place. That's a requirement of the officer, and I'll let Ty talk about your rights as a parent or a student to respond, but part of the reason why the officer is doing that is because if the officer can determine on the scene that you are either above 17 or you're directly coming home from work or something like that, they are not allowed to write you a citation, 
okay? If the officer, however, based on the circumstances, determined that you are in violation, they have the authority to write you a citation. They can also warn you or more than likely call your parent to come get you, but they can issue you a Class C misdemeanor citation, which means that if you come to court and plead guilty and say, I just want to pay the fine, you could be fined up to $500 under our city ordinance. More than likely, however, you're probably going to get sentenced if you're that minor. You're going to get sentenced to teen court, which is community service, and that ticket will be dismissed. If you plead not guilty, you think you have a defense, you'll set it for court where you can talk to the prosecutor about what uh, may have been the defense, and the prosecutor will then decide whether or not they are going to um, try you or they're going to dismiss the case or give you something else based on what you think is a reason for being in violation of the curfew. So um, I'm thinking I want to make sure I got through all of what I think I got, I did. So if there are any questions, do you want them to ask now or later? Okay, so I'm done and I'm again grateful to have you all here to explain this to you and I look forward to the question and answer period. Awesome, thank you again. That was uh, Letitia Brown who is a representative from our city attorney's office. Um, at this point, um, we'll have uh, Ty Stimson who is a representative from the L. Clifford Davis Association. Um, and he'll be presenting on um, a couple of things. One, um, giving us um, some advice on what our rights are as parents, as minors, and as adults who could potentially be impacted by this ordinance. Um, and then secondly, to give advice um, uh, on um, what you could do, you know, if you have um, a defense to prosecution under the proposed uh, current ordinance. So Ty, come on up. Um, and then after you present, we'll open the floor for Q&A. Well, good evening, everyone. As Dr. Williams indicated, my name is Ty Stimson. I bring greetings from L. Clifford Davis Legal Association, or better known as the Black Bar Association of Tarrant County. Uh, thank you for allowing us to join you in this space in this town hall. Uh, and who I also have with me is Leon Reed, who is our Social Action Committee Chair. And, and I would invite him up at, once he uh, gathers his bearings to assist me in this. Uh, and so as, as Dr. Williams indicated, uh, you know, one, uh, some of your rights as parents, as 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 minors uh, under this proposed ordinance, and and I just want to give the legal disclaimer. I'm not giving legal advice; just giving interpretation of how I read the ordinance. So just so we're we're all clear. Uh, but before an officer initiates any type of detainer or any type of arrest, the way the ordinance indicates is that a police officer is going to first ask if there's uh, if there's any essentially available defense. So whether or not uh, if a, a, a minor is on a curfew, I mean, not on a curfew, on an errand, there's an emergency. So, you know, let's say for instance, when I was in growing through school, my mom didn't like going to the store if she forgot something for that she's cooking. So it might be 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, hey, go to Walmart and pick something up. Well, that's an errand for a parent that's, that's typically sanctioned, uh, which would not classifies a violation of the city ordinance. Uh, another example is, you know, there's a family emergency and someone needs to, a minor needs to drive someone to the hospital or go pick someone up or someone's involved into an, uh, a car accident. Again, that's a, a, a sanctioned defense. Uh, when you read the ordinance and when you just kind of look at what the intended purpose it is, it's more so geared towards uh, minor children who basically have no business being out, their parents don't know where they're at, their guardians don't know where they're at, and they're committing an offense or a crime. It's, you know, it's not one of those how it's interpreted from the city ordinance or how historically it's been used. It's not one of those, uh, uh, let me make contact with a minor just to see how old they are, if they're doing anything. It's, you no, know, typically there's going to be some type of uh, suspicion as to w what this child or minor is doing um, at this particular place. Uh, and this is where I turn it over to Leon Reed, who's also a criminal defense attorney here in Fort Worth uh, in Tarrant County that can probably also give some more uh, uh, advice or guidance of what to do if you're a minor child or if you find yourself as a parent in these situations as well. So Leon, I'll yield the floor to you to. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Councilman Williams. I I always have to kind of monitor what I say 
um, in situations like this because um, the data over the course of the past two decades uh, since it's been required is still disturbing when it comes to the treatment of minorities who are of age in the city of Fort Worth. When you look at the city's racial profiling data, since it was required by state law, minorities in Fort Worth every single year without exception and without fail have been cited, arrested, searched disproportionately to our population. And now that's being extended to our youth, not by our data, but by the city's data. When you look on here and you see almost 40% of the curfew violations are just African Americans alone. African Americans do not make up 40% of the city of Fort Worth's population. When you couple that 40% with the 28% Hispanic, that's 68%, that's almost 70% of the curfew violations being minorities. And so it's, it's troublesome that in 2023, the city of Fort Worth doesn't have the foresight to figure out a better way than by using police. Um, it's already difficult for African American parents to tell their kids with a straight face, always trust the police. So when accosted by a police officer, after curfew, uh, statistical data, basically, and it's been found by some courts that African Americans have a reason to run. That's not Leon, that's courts. And so we have to tell our kids in those situations, one, keep your cell phone on you, and try, if you're in a group of more than one person, somebody start recording. Somebody get a parent or another adult on the phone uh, until such time as it can be determined that that police officer does not have any ulterior motives. Just to what Ty was speaking of earlier, several years ago, back when the 7-Eleven was still located at the corner of Horn Street and Camp Bowie, um, I had a situation where I went to the 7-Eleven and a young man was sent on his bicycle uh, to the store to get something for his aunt. This kid was my next door neighbor. And that particular night he was staying at his aunt's house who sent him to the store. And I just happened to be there when a police officer started questioning him. And I'm glad that I was because the manner in which this 14 year old who was of good size, but I knew him and I knew he was 14 years old, the manner in which he was being treated was troublesome to me. And so it's always um, a delicate situation, but I would suggest that the city, of council, the city council and the Fort Worth leadership find a different way and work earnestly towards that different way. But as a parent, one, uh, know where your child is. Um, the flip side, when they get cited or if a parent gets cited, you'll typically find a warrant being issued. And then when they run a license plate and they'll tell you, oh, we run everybody's license plates. Well, you're a busy person all day and I'm surprised you're not getting in the way more wrecks. But if they run a plate and see that there's a warrant, now you're creating a cycle of somebody missing work, potentially losing their job, uh, and, and constantly being pulled over. 
which feeds into that same statistical data. Again, this data has this Fort Worth Longhorn on it. It's nobody's data but the city's. And so at the end of the day, parents, uh, we encourage you to, one, know where your kids are. If there comes a time when your children are accosted by the police, hopefully there's more than one, somebody get on the phone, somebody record. And that's something you don't just tell your kid to do. It's something that you rehearse and practice with your child, just like you should be doing when your child has a learning permit at 15 or 16. You practice that with your children so that your children don't panic and try to drive home a half a mile to get back to safety and end up the victim of a felony stop by police officers. You have to practice it. So you practice the situations when your child is being accosted by police. That is just the reality of policing in Fort Worth in minority communities. So at that point, uh, if you get cited, contact an attorney as quickly as possible. So there are plenty of good defense attorneys in the city of Fort Worth who know how to handle these things and can come up with various alternatives uh, within the city prosecutor's office that uh, would have less severe economic impact uh, while achieving the goals of the city. Sometimes this stuff can just be uh, lost in translation. Again, in a situation as we've determined, you know, culture shouldn't be a crime. If, if grandma or auntie says run up to the store to get something for me and they're in the middle of something and they can't leave, um, that should not be a crime and we need to have the discernment to know when it shouldn't be and a lot of times that's best meted out, um, unfortunately, with attorneys downtown. And so, uh, with that in mind, if anyone has, uh, are we at a Q&A or, I'm sorry? Okay, so um, that's, that's mine. Alrighty, at this point, um, we're gonna open the floor for Q&A. Thank you all for providing your perspective to the discussion. Um, at this point, um, myself and city staff are available for any questions that you have. Um, I'll be repeating the question because we are recording. Um, and so um, it's not because I didn't hear you. I want to make sure that the folks on camera hear you. So this time the floor is open. You said you have an assistant chief here? Yes, sir. Can we bring him up? Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, we have Executive Assistant Chief Aldridge. Um, the gentleman here has a question for you. Okay. Um, the Fort Worth Police Department, does it use these uh, interactions with, uh, I won't use the cost because I, I think that's a, a inflammatory word interaction with these young young men, young people out on the street, do they use it as a semi-form of stop and frisk or is it a tool that, uh, that the Fort Worth Police needs? So for us, I, I want to be extremely clear on this. I look at the teen curfew as a caretaking function. I look at it as getting these young youth that are in situations they probably shouldn't be in back into a safe environment. That, that's what our goal is. That's always our goal is get them back with a parent or guardian. When we issue citations, we don't take them to jail. Um, we call the parents or we call a guardian to come pick them up. It is not a tool for stop and frisk. It is merely whenever we see them in situations that may be dangerous to them, because in all honesty, most of the stores that, are, that, are, that would be open late at night, um, there's, there's no reason for these young individuals to be there. So, you know, there's not any activities late at night. And I'll tell you quite honestly, probably one of the biggest questions that I have, um, and regardless of race, uh, you know, demographics, is, is why are these young people out late at night anyway? Um, what, what is causing them to go out late at night to put themselves in a, in a bad situation? All right. But isn't that without context of culture? Sorry, um, if you do have a question, raise your hand. We'll call you that way we can um, continue to have a productive dialogue. Um, you had a question? Um, well, I'm gonna have to know 
You can make a comment or questions. We also have comment cards for those of you who just arrived um, in the back as well to leave your comments. Absolutely, you can make it there. Okay. So, first I was going to say, I think that's also about context of culture. Uh, but that's another conversation that always my hands work. So I just want to get feedback to say, I just wrote it down to okay? that. Honestly, uh, first off, I hope that as my district councilman, that you vote against this. Honestly, I'm disappointed that a city that says they took their race and culture task force seriously would propose this ordinance. Curfews have a long history in our country. Anything rooted from slavery, grown in Jim Crow, and fed by white supremacy cannot be for me, people who look like me, or my children. Too long we have let people who don't look like us, don't support us, and don't understand us act in local parentis to our families and communities. I say no more. A report out of Columbia Law stated that black, Latinx, and indigenous youth are often police ticketed and fined for minor misbehavior like curfew violations and loitering at rates much higher than white youth. Without proper oversight of law enforcement, I personally want to limit the amount of seemingly justifiable interactions our law enforcement has with our youth. Moreover, this really is not an issue of curfew. This is really more of an issue of underfunding social services and education. I want to close with an article quote that I read that said, because we talk about our kids being out, why are they out? There's no reason to expect them to abide by a mandatory bedtime if the daytime gives them nothing to dream about. Mm. Uh, well. Mr. Yes, sir. I say this in my private citizen capacity and resident of Como. Uh, for years, the Como Community Center uh, under the offices of the Boys and Girls Club coming up program uh, had midnight basketball. The community center was open till midnight almost every night. Mm. And uh, when it closed, the children would walk home. And so, pro and, and that program uh, was so successful in Como that basically we worked ourselves out of a program. <laughs> and, and the city ended up uh, I hate to say it, defunding that program, okay? That's just the legitimate straight up facts that uh, crime in the area and so forth went so far down and that came, that happened at a NAC function. But they took that program away because they said it's no longer justified in this community. Basically it works, so we're taking it away. And so uh, to a program like that that worked, I don't know if other areas of the city are using it or have used it. Uh, I would say, hey, it worked for us, it could work for your neighborhood too. But uh, then, you know, having the kids walk home would have them committing a crime according to the statute. And so, again, there are just issues, and then there are just data issues with who is being stopped. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Yeah, just looking at the data that you presented, uh, or that you got from the city and that you gave it to us, um, the main reason why this law was enacted was to one, decrease crime, and two, decrease youth victimization. Is that correct? Um, so in uh, previous work sessions and at council, um, it was mentioned uh, during those by city staff that um, this ordinance would, in fact, be a useful tool to reduce crime. Okay. And within the ordinance, there is no mentioning of another reason why this ordinance exists. It doesn't even mention that it's there to reduce crime. So that's the assumption that we're all working off of, is that this is to reduce crime. But when we look at the curfew violate or citations that are given, 98.7% um, of them are given as singular curfew violations, meaning the individual was not committing a crime at the time that they were cited for breaking the curfew. Uh, only 11 violations, and this is since 2015, um, only 11 out of 832 were committed in conjunction with another crime. Uh, and we don't know what those crimes are. Uh, maybe you can 
tell us. But, Absolutely happy to. Uh, yeah. So that's 1.3% of these curfew citations actually helping to remedy the problem that this curfew was set up to remedy in the first place. The other 98.7% of the time, people are literally just living their lives, and now they have up to $500 fine, they have a court costs, they have to go to team court, which to my understanding, the team court is just court with convenience. You still get fined. I'd like clarification on that. Um, but it, what it tells me is that this curfew is ineffective in reducing crime, because it didn't do that, but 1.3% of the time, maybe, we'll see what kind of secondary offense was committed. Um, and then, is there any data to say that this reduces youth victimization? I don't see that anywhere. Yeah, um, I'll answer um, in terms of the secondary violations. Um, since 2015, um, 11, there was 11 of those tickets where um, a minor received a curfew filing and then a ticket for a second offense. Um, of those 11, um, 10 were tra minor traffic violations. Um, and then one was related to a kid walking um, in the street when there was a sidewalk available. Um, zero were, were related uh, to crimes against property or crimes against persons. You said zero were related to crimes against persons or property? Yes, and then we have William Runnelly who can answer your questions about the fines for teen court. So no gang stuff. No gang, no, no gang stuff. So everything got there. And so my second question is, what is the on the teen court, what are the fines? What are the fines for teen court? Teen court? Yeah, part of that question. Is there, when they go to teen court, you're saying they automatically get their $500 or up to $500 fine dismissed, that's automatic? I want to answer that question, then I'm going to clarify uh, something. Um, about crimes and the Class C citations. The first one, and William, you can jump in, is um, when you come to teen court, your fine in and of itself is dismissed. You don't have the $500 fine. You are required to pay a teen court fee, which is about $20 uh, for the teen court program, and then you're required to do some form of community service and um, as part of that, which normally means you at least have to return and participate in the teen court program in some form or fashion. So it's community service plus a $20 fine. And I just want to make sure you understand that as with all Class C citations, so it really doesn't matter if it's a teen curfew or you get pulled over for uh, speeding, and they find a gun in the car that you're not allowed to have. Typically what happens is if police officers are going to arrest you for a higher level crime, they don't write you for the Class C because it just doesn't make any sense to do both. So there is no, um, so the, I say that because it's important to note that if a person is out under age and they would have been in violation of the curfew, but they committed a felony, they're gonna get arrested for the felony. They're not gonna write on a teen curfew because they've been arrested for a felony. And that's just the way that it typically has always been done in our court system. In that. our court system, Class C's. I would just um, add one more thing for context um, to that. Um, one of the pieces of information that we don't have is how many stops were made um, under the suspicion of a curfew ordinance violation that then led to something more serious. And so I want to provide that caveat because we don't have that data, so you won't see that on here. Yep. So William Rumley, I'm the court director. Thank you all for coming tonight and letting me speak. I just want to, one other thing on the teen court, it is $20, um, $10 uh, cost and $10 administrative fee. However, the uh, judge has the ability to waive that. So if somebody's declared indigent or for some circumstances, they can even waive that $20 fee. And you only are, uh, go to teen court if you plead guilty or found guilty as a teen. So it's not an automatic, you're just ordered there. Um, and it's a, a program, of a teen peer program. So just wanted to clarify that. And then this has already been spoken on, but similar to the data, the 11 offenses, I just wanted to reiterate that those 11 were only related to Class C offenses. So the court provided that data, the municipal court. 
So the, uh, the additional citations we talked about were other Class Cs, and it's already been mentioned by uh, Ms. Brown that um, if there were higher charges, those would have been handled separately and differently. That was not in our data, so I just wanted to clarify that. I have a question for him. Just on that, you see the $20 fee may be removed, or you know, you get the $500 fee automatically removed when you go to the court, but you've pleaded guilty. What happens to your record once you plead guilty? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so what I would say is, is number one, uh, they can plead guilty or no contest or be found guilty. Um, and then um, they go to teen court. So immediately when they're recommending teen court, there's not a $500 fine. It's a $20 fine. But again, the judge, based on the circumstance of the individual, can determine if they're going to waive that. Uh, these particular offenses um, are not reported to the state. So these don't go to the state, and judges do not issue warrants on these. When we're talking curfew, they do not issue warrants on these. So for these, and I want to be clear, I'm talking about the juvenile cases. So you heard earlier in the presentation, there's three groups that can be issued a citation. Number one, the juvenile. Number two, the parent or legal guardian. Uh, and number three, an, an entity. So uh, an adult potentially could have a warrant issued um, and again, there's two reasons the warrants would be issued for failure to respond or failure to comply with the court's order. But, uh, you know, the lion's share of these are for juveniles, and, and I know that's one of the main concerns we're talking about tonight. Um, there are no warrants issued. These are not state reported, not state reportable. Um, and when a teen goes through teen court, the case is dismissed. So it shows as a dismissal. Um, even though they pled guilty or no contest, when they go to teen court, it's what's called a deferred uh, judgment so they defer that guilty or no contest till the end if they successfully complete that then it's dismissed so if the juvenile does not then they're referred back to the court and see what other options they might be able to do and that just depends on the judge and their circumstances so this never goes on a, a, an individual's record if they get it as a juvenile. Never, it will never be reported uh, anywhere on their record. Hold on. Folks, we're going we're gonna, to um, take two more questions. Um, we are bumping up on time, and I want to make sure that we hear from as many people as possible. As you can tell, this is a robust discussion, and we won't have closure tonight, um, which is why we also have comment cards for you to leave with our office. So um, I saw two more questions in the back. Uh, yes. I hear correction, a lot of correction, but I don't hear care. And that's unacceptable. We talk about a mitigation strategy as far as, uh, and it is, I mean, citation, that, that, is a, that, that is a punitive, that's punishment, right? So what is the city doing as far as investment to put into care? If this was something that was meant to curb or curtail crime, what is the city's plan and I heard the attorney talk about the coming up program. What is the city doing from a standpoint of care to actually mitigate some of the challenges that we're seeing in community? I mean, we're, they're having a visual tonight for a student that was shot on the street the other day. Like, that didn't happen after curfew. That happened in the middle of the day. So if we're trying to do things to curtail and to, to help and to curb crime, what type of investment is the city willing to put into to make sure that there's care alongside of the correction? Because just correction will not work. And that's what the citation is. It corrects the problem there on the street. But if there's a problem with crime, how are we mitigating that? What, what is the care part? And honestly, I think from that standpoint, speaking of, since I am a former educator and education policy, that's how we're seeing problems, their community problems that creep into the school. We've got to figure out a way to show up our community. Therefore, we don't have those type of issues. So I just want the city to be mindful about the investment that it makes into mitigation and not so much the impact of punitive citations and, and, and correctives. Thank We've you. got to marry those two. Thank if you. you. I, I don't, like I said, we need to link way back into care, 
and not necessarily be so focused on criminal relations. Right. Thank you for your feedback. Um, all of this is really helpful as, you know, I continue to, um, you know, work on this issue um, on our district's behalf. Um, to your point, one thing I'll say that I've really valued um, about um, this council and the direction that um, our police department is trying to take is um, there's this mantra that you may hear a lot that we can't cite our way out of crime, um, that it's going to take all of us doing our part to ensure that we're not only keeping our children safe, but building safe neighborhoods and ultimately a safe city. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, Bring the people in that actually work with you. Those programmers that are underutilized resources in those communities, they're trying to work with you. Instead of just this being a police problem, bring everybody to the table, especially those that are trained in working with our students. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we have time for maybe one more question, um, and then we'll move on to the next segment of the listening session. Yes, ma'am. Um, let's take both of y'all. I saw both y'all raise at the same Very time. Very quickly. I want to just... I want to acknowledge the, I, heard, I hear a lot of what's supposed to happen. I hear a lot of policies and procedures and the way we do things, but we cannot, I cannot underscore enough how much tragedy occurs because of the policy to practice gap. And what we say is happening with law enforcement, what we say is happening in systems is not always what's happening in those real life situations. And so we can't lean too heavily into policy, and we, we have to think very deeply and consider practice. I also want to bring some very clear correction to a term that I heard earlier in the state, uh, in the listening circle about regardless of race, because when you use statements like regardless of race, what you're essentially doing is gaslighting communities of color who experience these issues at disproportionately higher rates than white children and white citizens. So we can't ever, particularly in a city that is majority minority, um, that is majority people of color, we make up almost 70% of the city's um, population. Therefore, when we say things like, regardless of race, in race-based situations and in race-based contexts with race-based problems, it is effectively slapping the faces of all the people who experience these issues on a daily basis. Yeah. I'm just studying the, um, the fact sheet, and it says 2015 to 2020, but there's no actual facts on the decrease in crime. Like, it's just innovation. So I'm just trying to figure out why we would carry a curfew for five years with no data on the decrease and increase of crime. What are you, what are you, what is the solution? What are you doing? <laughs> We're trying to solve the problem. That, that is the question <laughs> that we are asking as a council office, right? Which is why we delayed this vote now three times, um, because we want to make sure that we have all the data that we need to make the best vote. Um, so do you have data residents. on how it has impacted public safety? I do not have that at this point. Then you're not measuring anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that um, well received. Um, just know that um, that's something that our office is really deeply um, interested in when we talk about making a vote on the curfew ordinance. Um, so and thank you all. Quick, but I would say it is actually something because the fact that the highest population Black male that 30% with the standard. Yes. After, it, it's actually showing that we're over, over almost 70%. Yeah, with no crimes back up. Yeah, so I think that we're, we're showing some. Right, with no, with no decrease in crime. Thank you. Well, it was 1.3%, right? Thank you. Right? Thank no you. Decrease. The decrease was 1.3%. Y'all, we are bumping up against time, and I know that this is a robust discussion. Um, the discussion doesn't end here, and that's the most important part for y'all sitting here, but also for you watching online. Um, we want to hear from you as a council office. Like I said, this is not Jared Williams' seat. Um, this is all of our seat, and we make decisions based on the input of the community. Um, and to that end, we have comment cards for those of y'all who are here in person. Um, we ask three things on that comment card. Um, we want to know your level of support of this ordinance, um, and we'd like to know um, more about that answer. So that's the second question. 
Um, and then lastly, when we want to hear any of your thoughts or concerns, uh, whether positive or negative or anywhere in between, um, don't hold back on your feedback because that helps us then go to council um, and be able to take your voice with us. Um, if you're online, um, you can email um, our office at district6 at forwardtexas.gov uh, to share your input um, with us on this very important decision. Um, and um, although we're a little bit before 7, I wanted to leave time before 7 for you all to ask direct questions to staff, to me. Um, we also have um, the District 6 office staff here. Um, Ms. Davia Johnson is our District 6 uh, District Director. Um, and Mr. Joshua Rivers is our Constituent Services Director. Um, that is a new position that's meant um, to address um, any concerns that you all have as District 6 residents. Um, and he's there walking alongside you every step of the way as we work to navigate answering your issue with city staff. Um, so with that being said, thank you all again for um, attending this important conversation and for lending your voice and perspectives to me on this important issue. Um, thank you to our city staff um, for helping um, to answer some of the questions that we received tonight. Um, thank you to the L. Clifford Davis uh, Associate, Legal Association uh, for also um, lending your expertise um, to the conversation. Um, and just as important, thank you all um, for taking time out of a Monday um, after a Cowboys loss. I know it's <laughs> not it hurts for many of us. I'm still recovering. Um, but nonetheless, just know that uh, your attendance here and your viewership is 